Thank you for coming down. Yes. You know, it's a Sunday morning, mm-hmm. very early. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a morning person? Do I consider myself a morning person? I've always w- woken up like like 5.36. Yeah, so I, I mean, waking up is one thing, but yeah. op- being like operational, yeah. I guess I only start, yeah. Like, I wake up in that sense. So what do you do like after you wake nine. up? nine. You have a routine yeah. or something? Um, Pretty much just use the, like, freshen up and everything, uh-huh. get changed, and then you're out for work. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, if, if it's a Saturday, it's a weekend kind of thing, then I'll be in bed till, like, 12. Mm. <laughs> do you, yeah. are you someone who doesn't need a lot of sleep? Because yeah. I think you don't sleep very early as well, right? Um, I per try. Say. I try uh. to sleep, like, w- at one Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to push it so I sleep by midnight. Yeah, mm. but usually I sleep like five hours kind of thing. And it's good yeah. for you. I mean, I take like short naps in mm. the day, so mm. I would. I guess I catch up on the in the with the sleep debt, like mm. yeah, on the weekends mm. kind of mm. thing. Mm. Uh, before we start, I have a gift for you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just a little uh, something for you, lah. So okay. you know, uh, my girlfriend, mm-hmm. she is uh, she likes to draw. Uh huh. Then she, she's she's like the uh, biggest supporter of my podcast. Cool. So, so very nice to have someone like who loves you, really yeah, supports you, and who yeah. really like supports your work. Mm-hmm. It's very um, nice to have, like you said. I just started this in January, mm-hmm. and you know she's always like watching my episodes. <laughs> It's really sweet. <laughs> then she would like, um, you know, um, because like for YouTube, you know, to monetize, you need like public watch hours, yes. right? For like 4,000 hours. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes, um, uh, because it's so new, right? So sometimes after I edit the episode, I would like mm-hmm. send it over to her. Mm-hmm. Then she would just like be my QC and my better. Mm. La. You know, she's, a, she's the first person that gives me the feedback. Then after the, uh, the episode is published, right? She'll be like, it's okay, let me watch it again. <laughs> you know, let me just... Yeah, to get the hours, right? Yeah, let me just run it oh, while I'm working so and sweet. let me just watch it again. Mm-hmm. So Girlfriend, <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> so we also know that it's our yeah. birthday this month. Oh, thank you. So of course, yes. I was very excited. You know, I always tell uh-huh. her I always tell her about the guests I have. Mm-hmm. Like, I already scheduled. I managed, I managed to book. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, it's your birthday. But more importantly, I think um, we are very inspired by your story as well. Oh, okay. Like you being Thank like you. so brave <laughs> and you know doing what you want to do. Yeah. So she drew something for you. Oh my goodness! So sweet. I got it framed <laughs> up for you, and okay. we hope you like it. Okay. <laughs> Am I supposed to see it? <laughs> yeah. Like, should I open it for you first? Okay, um, let me just, sure. Let me just open. It. Or maybe we open. Okay, let me open for you because the leg, right? Okay. I gave one. I previously I gave one to my brother as well. Then I went to his house. It was my nephew's one year old birthday lah. Mm. Went to his house ah. Then I saw it leaning against the the, the Oh, the because wall. the leg kind of. Yeah. Then I asked him, hey, "What happened?" Then he was like, "Oh, you know, I when I was opening opening the plastic, then I broke the leg." Oh no! Oh my goodness. Okay. She's a uh, amateur, you know, hobbies okay. lah. You know, so. No, like. Any anything that is really but it's something that I like, really want you to have. Aww. Okay, maybe you can tear this off yourself. <laughs> it's so sweet. So I'm supposed to look at it now. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. It's so cute, right? Yes, it is really <laughs> cute. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. This is this is pretty. I like all the sparkles behind it. Are they supposed to see it? Yeah, sure, please. <laughs> <laughs> So this is one of my recent, most recent photos, posts. right? Mm. Yes. So um, yes, if you don't know, I'm a content creator, sex worker, and yes. Ta-da! Can you take off the? Take off the oh, cause yeah. it's it's reflecting. Huh? Yeah. Is this the right angle? Uh, I think maybe you can go closer a bit. Closer. Like. Yeah. So this is one of the pictures yeah. that I saw. Mm. So black is your favorite color. Um, black is. I like blue. I like pinks, reds. Um, black is just. I don't know. There is there is an allure to mm. black. So, 
I wouldn't say it's like one of my favorites, but I think it's one of the easiest to like complement my skin. So mm, because you're more on the fairer, yes. fairer side. Mm. Just now you mentioned that you know you are a content creator and you are a sex worker. When people ask you today, uh, you know, s- someone just come up to you and ask you someone new and ask you mm-hmm. what do you do. You know, how do you typically <laughs> introduce yourself? Oh, um, I mean, I have other jobs, so I will give them the more. Um, Conventional Yes The safe for work version of myself <laughs> Yeah So um, I mean I, I I usually say that You know Oh I do streaming I do other small businesses On the side Yeah So It's a kind of Like mm, I don't do this But I do this So mm. yeah People who know Who mm-hmm. know lah. People who know Who know Yes Okay but I'm not I'm not very I'm not very shy About it as in, I will tell people that I do it if they really ask and they know. Yeah, but I, I guess it's more of a filter because society. So, like, um, you don't you don't just go straight up to the person mm. and like, hey, I take off my uh, clothes for the camera mm. and I earn money through it. Mm. I'll be like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, so I guess it's uh, the other person's comfort level as well. Uh. Emotionally, yeah. from your point of view, mm. right, is it a defense mechanism as well? Is it a defense mechanism? I guess in some sense, yes. Because like, if that person is judgmental... And you never know, right? Yes, you, yeah, never, know. you never know. So yeah. then you will get all sorts of crazy, you know, crazy comments and attacks even. Yeah, so that's the... Do you, do you, do you think that people are generally not so upfront about it in person? Like, not so Of course, upfront. they are keyboard warriors always. Mm. But when they are in person, maybe they just like, you know, politely just reserve their comments and... Or have you experienced like I very have. bland, blatant kind of... Yeah, uh, so there are some people who... They've been very forthright. I don't know, it's forthright the word. Yeah, f- like very in your face when it comes to like, oh, what you're doing is wrong. You know, uh, even being trans is wrong. Yeah, and so... um. Those people, I mean, they will, they will. Yeah, there are some people who um, tolerate it. Mm. But then, you know, after like one, two meetings and then they just shun you after that. Because like, yeah, they... So like MIA lah. Something like that, okay. yeah. But most of my friends, they've been very, very kind. They've been very nice. And when they, when they found out, when I came out to them, then they, they were like shocked. And after the initial shock, they were like, "Oh my goodness, I'm so happy for you right now." I, I didn't even know. I couldn't have even. T- uh, I couldn't tell back then. When was this? When was this? This was actually in 2020 when I started. You but came 2019, up. 2019, mm. I had already been like thinking about like the whole process and doing some like search on the internet. I wouldn't really call it research. Research. It was more of a let's go find some anecdotal stories like. Is it going to suit me, you know, kind of thing? Yeah. So, I, 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 I realise we haven't actually introduced ourselves. Sure, you want to do introduction? <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, hi, I'm Eri, and I'm a trans content creator slash uh, porn star. And yeah, so, um, I recently tr- started my transition in 2020. So, do you want the whole story of it? No, you can do whatever you're comfortable with, then we can talk about it along the way. Okay. Yeah. Like, um, okay, the, the fast the fast track through it was um I used to work for the government. I got worried about coming out along the way, um the and the I want to do porn um came out. Um and I tried it. So and then I knew that it would be in conflict with what the government stands for. So I quit the service. And yeah, so here I am doing porn and transitioned. So yeah, the process was an interesting process. Mm. So mm-hmm. I don't think the specific job in the government matters because, um, you know, the civil service is civil service. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, being in a position like yours, whether you are in a certain ministry or a certain step board, I don't think it makes mm-hmm. a difference. But um, what? why were you so concerned that the civil service wouldn't accept who you are? Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, cause did they made it very blatant to you? No, or? it wasn't very blatant. It was more of a I in in some sense I assumed that they would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because um, if you if you know media laws, um, LGBT in media will never be portrayed in a positive light. Uh, with all the conflict coming from very conservative parts of society, mm. um, there is always this. Oh, you know. Uh, we have to hide you away. We will not persecute you for your lifestyle, but you know you should not be in public. You just lead your lifestyle yeah. quietly. Yes. Mm. So that has always been the impression, and that has always been the strain, the underlying kind of um, messaging and tone through every every layer of the government. Yeah, so, so do you have like mm. colleague or supervisor that you sort of like try and sound out, you know, like float some balloons and see what's the direction going to be like? The 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 first person I came out to was a lesbian. Yeah, so she was a lesbian butch and she was really sweet. And she just um like she really helped me through the whole process thinking about things and just being there as an emotional support that was really that was what I really needed at that time yeah and eventually she told me that if it comes to that you really have to just tell them like your yeah. your workplace yes my boss and all that so eventually I did so in 20 okay so the whole story 2019 um, I started thinking about is this really the life I wanted to be living because I've been like hiding under this I am a guy, mm. kind of like facade. And it's not that I didn't try. I went through army. I In uni, I played rugby. I tried to be like the macho guy. And it didn't work out. Yeah, so I've always had these thoughts about like, you know, um, I'm different. I'm not a typical guy. You know, I like feminine stuff. And 2019 just, just happened that, I just thought about it, like, I've always been this because my conservative Christian parents have told me this is, has told me that this is wrong. You know, I shouldn't be doing this. And I've always been living like that to please them. What about myself? Yeah, so I decided that, okay, let's, let's test it out. So I went, I called up some of my Thai um, trans friends. And then we were, and I was like, okay, um, I'm coming to Thailand this December. For one and a half weeks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need your help. Mm. Dress me up, do my makeup, and things like that, and let me just experience if this is the right path for me. Yeah, and so I did that. It was like the best one and a half weeks ever. Mm. Yeah, and I came back to Singapore. I knew I had to do something. So 2020 March, I went to see a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist, it was a private psychiatrist, and he was like, "Yeah, you have gender dysphoria." Go, uh, blood test, go, here's the pills and everything. So the process was really quick. Um, follow-ups with um, private endocrinologists. It was very expensive. Mm. Yeah, and it was just hiding. Like, hiding in plain sight. Because I was a very front-facing... Um, um, yeah, in, in where I was working, I was very front-facing. So for five days, I would be presenting as a guy and two days as myself. Yeah, all the way up to November and December uh, when there was a New Year's Eve party. So back in 2020, there was still eight people. Yeah. It was so like we the, dropped to two and then yeah. ten, you know. Mm. Yeah. So um, there were two people on at the table where we were having dinner who didn't know I was trans. So somehow along the way, the conversation just came up. But yeah. you were there as a woman. Yes. Okay. I was presenting as, mm, mm. Um, as myself. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just, they they were shocked that oh my goodness, you're trans. I couldn't mm. even tell, and that was like confirmation to me la. It, We we call this like cis passing privilege. So if someone doesn't know, and they just look at you on the street, they just immediately assume that you are a cis female. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, that was really, that was really, um, that was a confirmation for me. La. But then after New Year, when I went back to work, the first day putting on guy clothes, looking like a guy again, my goodness, the anxiety, 
the the stress. I couldn't go to work that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the subsequent days after that, all the way till I actually told my boss, hey, I have something to tell you. Yeah. Um, I'm trans. Um, this is me. I showed them my Instagram. And they were like, oh, okay, we'll figure a way for you. Yeah, so it was nice that I didn't lose my job immediately. You know, yeah, I didn't lose my job. Mm. So one thing, I think kudos to the government. Yeah, the government does take care of people. Mm, Maybe not the way we wish we would be taken care of. But I guess you have to be understanding in some sense. If it's not the right time yet. Mm. Yeah, some things you don't push. Because the pushback will be even worse. Yeah. So, um, that, yeah, so they transferred me. And I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the people around me a lot. Yeah, people who took care of me in the different department. But I didn't like the work I was doing. So yeah. they transferred you because of the new knowledge that they yes. had? To a more back role, yes. back, back more office kind of role, more kind of admin kind of role. Yeah. Okay. So that I was thankful for. What was your original role? You, you do have to face a lot of uh, like yes. public and all. Yeah. yeah. So I had to talk to a lot of people. Yeah. So if like the, <coughs> put it like clients, yeah, if they suddenly saw a different side of me, they'll be like, yeah, and you don't know who are the conservative ones. But you have never presented yourself as yourself at work, right? You have always dressed up as a man when going yes, to work at that time. Exactly. So was there a conversation with your boss that time that, you know, how you would dress up when you come to work? Or do you make a request for you to be yourself going to work it, before you eventually resign? Okay, so at at the new workplace, they understood that new so, role, that yeah, admin role. So okay. I was able to dress. In some sense, they said, okay, you can dress more androgynously, mm-hmm. but still wear pants and shirts. Just don't be too... Yeah, just okay. don't be over the top. Don't, don't go all out. Dress. Right? Okay. Come in a dress, yeah, okay. you know. Okay. So in that sense, I was like... Ah, but you, you had know. long hair, right, at that time? Yeah, I, my hair yeah. was growing out. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So have you ever put on makeup to, to work at that point Once of time? Once or twice, yes. Actually, okay. yeah. What do you think would have happened if you didn't resign mm-hmm. and you just stayed on at your work? Someone would have found out about the sex work. <laughs> okay. And so that, 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 would be a, that would be a big no-no. Yes. Okay. There are two contrasting points. La. So um, if, I didn't, if I didn't want, if I had no want to do sex work, yeah, I would probably have stayed and I would definitely have asked for another thran- transfer. Yeah, like halfway through this year, I would have asked for a transfer. When you start doing sex work? When I start doing sex work, um, I started posting nudes online um, before I actually transitioned. So oh. it was, a uh, hey, this is interesting. So even before mm. your Twitter account? Even before my Twitter account, okay. yes. Okay. You know the days when we had Tumblr? Mm. <laughs> yes, when Tumblr was okay for sex work before they totally scrapped it and then Tumblr just died. Yeah, so that was the days where you would ex- I, I, I explored. Yeah, so posted some stuff and I was like, there was good feedback from it. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is very validating as well. And this might be something I would like to explore. Yeah, and so um, the exploration, it went through and I just decided that yeah, this is something I really want to pursue. When you first started out, what was your scope of sex work? What was my scope of sex work? Mostly like you just, just posted online yeah, on a Tumblr? Just nudes. Okay. Like faceless, anonymous nudes. Yeah. At the point of time, you were still in the civil service, right? So yes. I would um, imagine that you financially, you were okay? I was okay. So what's the motivation behind doing sex work? Oh, motivation hmm. was... One, I would say, yes, attention. Okay. And two, it's just the freedom of just the autonomy, the bodily autonomy. To just yeah. like embrace yeah. yourself and be confident and just show it out to the exactly. world. Exactly. This is okay. this is me. If you don't accept me, close the browser. Mm. And if you like it, thank you. You know, yeah. So this is my body. I get to do what I want with my body. Yeah. 
I think Tumblr is an interesting platform in the sense that um, it gives very niche content creators mm-hmm. uh, a, a content. So you don't. Uh, I'm sure it's you still. You sh- I'm sure. I'm sure you still get some shit shit comments lah. <laughs> but I think generally people go there looking for what they are looking for. That's true. Yep. And they enjoy the content. Reddit as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, Reddit as well. But when you go try and go a bit more mainstream, then there's the problem, right? Yes. So Instagram, um, Instagram is a problem. Twitter is still very much okay with... Twitter is quite open, like, actually. Sex work. Yep, yes. Yep. Twitter is one of the best platforms, mm. honestly speaking. Mm. Like, even even though they have banned some people on Twitter, um, because um, it's a very it's a very grey area as well. So it because depends reported on... Them? Yeah, it depends mm. on who reports. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, most, most content is allowed. Yeah, you have very... You have people who fight on Twitter... And it's free speech. Yeah, so that's one of the best platforms, I'd say. Mm. Yeah, but I guess Instagram, because you are catering to a different crowd, a younger audience as well. So, yeah, anyone who's not 21, yeah, you want to be having that filter as well. And strictly no nudes as well. Yes, mm. correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, coming back to a bit earlier... You know, when your parents find out, or when you tell your parents that, or when did they um, start to realize that <laughs> our boy at home is, you know, perhaps not a not a normal boy, typical boy. I don't know if they really, they really realized it, because when I was very young, I would already be playing with my playing with the girls, my other cousins who were girls. I enjoyed playing with like their dolls, their like cooking, like we would, we would, uh, you know, like conventionally masa, masa, the girly you know, stuff, yeah, okay, those, the girly and, and games, I okay. would take my mom's clothes and just wear them, and then I got caught for it, yeah, and then they were like, oh, you know, you're a Christian, you cannot do this. What's your earliest impression of memory of doing something like this, like wearing your mom's clothes, or wanting to put on makeup, you know? When do you first realize to yourself that hey, you know, I I feel like girl inside. I have no idea how old I was, but it was somewhere in primary school. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. God bless you. So somewhere in primary school, and um, I just, yeah, I just wanted to like wear a dress. Yeah. Um, just. Because I, I do the laundry at home. Mm. Yeah, and like the... It was just like, okay, hang stuff up and everything. And then I always wondered, what's so different about like the clothes? And to me, I was more drawn to like my mom's clothes. <laughs> and like, this dress is really pretty. Let me try it on. And I looked at myself in the <coughs> mirror and I was like, this is so pretty. Why can't I wear this? You know, I like I like wearing this. Why do I have to be dressed only in like you know shorts and t shirts? Yeah, and so um, one day I was doing that. Unfortunately, I took a nap. Mm. Yeah, and so my parents came back and found me when you were in primary school. Yeah, mm. and so it was a <gasps> oh no kind of thing. Do you yeah. have siblings? I have an elder brother. Okay. Yeah. So has your direct family members ever tried to have like very honest and candid conversation with you, or was it more always more of like a you know denier or avoid avoidance kind of? We attitude? never talked about it after that. Yeah. So because I, in some sense, I never re-expressed it. So they thought it was probably a, just a phase kind of thing. But to me, it was a okay. If this is the way I should be living my life, I will try. And I did. So throughout my whole life, my whole Christian life as well, I'm still a Christian. Yeah, I still I still believe. Um, not the same way some other Christians would say. You know, yeah. Um, but I, it's not that I didn't try. Yeah. And... Try to be a boy. Yes. Okay. To 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 that spiritual extent of like crying to God, 
mm. and asking him why is this happening to me to that extent that I was so spiritual with my walk with God that I would curse like the girl inside me to die so that mm. I can live a life that glorifies mm. God you know mm. that kind of to that extent and it didn't work out Did God, yeah. look, did God sort of like <laughs> talk to you? In, you know, in the Christian kind of belief? No. No, okay. So yeah. you never had any like... I mean, God never appeared like, oh, you... Da, 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 or you, you didn't know. hear like a voice? Yeah, I wasn't. Okay. The only time I heard like something like that was... Also, interestingly, it was one of the times where I was trying so hard as a guy. Mm-hmm. You know, the typical toxic masculine kind of, oh, I must go to every single club, pick up every single girl, have sex with them. So I've done that, been there. And uh, one night while drinking and like just dancing with this girl, suddenly I sobered up. Mm. All of a sudden, you know, you, you drink, you're high, you don't suddenly just, yeah, yeah. and you sober up. Yeah, I sobered up okay. and I heard a voice. Okay. Like call my name mm-hmm. and literally ask this, why are you treating women like objects? Mm. No person oh, high. I, know, I got like goosebumps <laughs> hearing this. No thing. man. Yeah, no man yeah. high and mm-hmm. having a, a consenting girl mm. right there dancing with you would be like, uh, I'm sorry, I... I'm not going to do this tonight. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so that was my encounter with God. That that okay. that I know. I mean, people can can like dispute it like, oh, maybe it's your inner subconscious, you know, kind of thing. But I choose to ascribe it to God. Yeah. That is a very hard <laughs> question, right? Mm-hmm, that That's is a, a very, very hard difficult. question. Yes. And are you guilty of it at the point of time? Was I guilty of it? Yeah. <coughs> guilty meaning meaning the the question posed to you. Yeah. Why are you Why are you uh, objectifying women? You know. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. But there was a process that it's part of your mechanism to try and man up and do yes. things that guys should do lah. I unfortunately learned how to be toxic lah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like you see the guys around you, like oh they're always talking about you know oh this girl is so pretty. You know, I slept with this girl and stuff yep. like that. Boys and talk. so you're yep. like, shit, I'm not doing that. I need mm. to be a guy. I need to man up. So, so immediately, what mm. what happened when after you heard that? In your, oh, in your my mind life took 180. Okay. Yeah, and so after that, I, I, I learned how to respect people. Yeah, and I think it was it was a period where I really grew, and my relationship with girls, like with women. Yeah, just in that sense became a better kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. When was this? How many years when ago? When was this? This yeah. was in uni. Mm. Yeah, so how many years ago? Oh my goodness. 10, 11, 11 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Coming back to the church, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, coming from this uh, very Christian family background and being someone you identify yourself as being uh, spiritual as well. Mm-hmm. Have you ever told people in the church or the the pastor, you know, what you're feeling, what you're going through? The pastor, no, never. Okay, before before I came out, no. Mm. Yeah, I never told anyone about these things. Yeah, so it's a very hush hush kind of like my own battle. And it was like And your your singular conversation with God, lah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So whatever was coming from the pulpit, I would be. Like reading the Bible, asking God, and you know, just having that personal walk, uh. yeah. But then after that, when I came out, I started. I gave it a shot. I tried. I reached out to, like, um, the old Christians that I used to know, and surprisingly, yeah, there are a lot of people who are actually very accepting of it, and they're very loving. They'll be mm. like. Oh, you know, you're still the same person. You may be presenting outside differently, and yeah. Um, while I don't fully agree with your lifestyle, but you know, I accept you as a person. Yeah, and yeah. Um, let's let's rebuild our friendship. Yeah, because mm. I left church for a very long time because I got like disheartened by the leadership, 
and how they were running things. Nah. But that's independent of your lifestyle. It's la. independent yeah. of my mm. lifestyle. So that was that. Mm. Yeah, and so like it does make me want to come back because like now I see the people in a different light. So I mean, there are friendships to be forged again, and yeah, I think those would be very fruitful. Mm. So growing up, right, I would suspect. Correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong. Uh, you had a like what I would say like a typical kind of like pathway for most Singaporeans going through the education system, mm-hmm. going to university, mm-hmm. uh, being active in CCAs. Mm-hmm. Emotionally though, you know, while you are handling, juggling uh, work, uh, friendship, uh, schoolwork, you know, emotionally, what was it like when part of you just felt very conflicted? Was it like a difficult emotional kind of thing? No, because I learned to kill my emotions <laughs> mm. in some sense yeah um this is i don't know if this is a related point but i think our education system or at least our society teaches guys to not feel not have emotions yeah so that kind of kind of taught me how to you know what just turn off how you feel and just concentrate on your studies were you ever in a boys school or yes i was you i grew up I grew up 10 years in a boys' school. So primary plus secondary. Yes, okay. primary and secondary. I was never in the jock bunch. I was never like the sportiest kind of like... I got bullied for being too, you know... Mm, feminine. Like, yeah, mm. feminine and stuff. And yeah, so um, emotionally, I, t- I tuned it out. Like the bullying got really terrible in primary five and six, where there were people who would actually take my bag and throw it at me and my head. Yeah, and I couldn't do anything at all. Yeah, so to me, it was just, okay, just, just shut off my emotions. Mm. And um, coming back to that Christian life, that was like God was my center and my only source of like, Comfort, mm. yeah. Every time they would do it, I would be crying. But the only person I would call out to was God, la. Yeah, and and that that brought me through like pretty much all of school. Yeah, was it like Christians, uh, Catholic school? It was or a Catholic, Catholic school. school. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, having your classmates bully you at a point mm. of time, right? Um. So. Of course, and when you are prem five from six, you don't, and it was a time whereby there wasn't so much like Google wasn't so prevalent. You know, there's no the internet isn't. It was so, Yahoo. <laughs> yeah, it was Yahoo. Okay. But yeah, mm. um, don't know whether you had a chance to do any research on yourself or how you felt or whether you were savvy enough to do it at, at, at that time at that time at your age. What was going through your mind at that point of time? Like, do do you think that am I gay or do you think like what's wrong with me or are we just confused? You know. Yeah, I was confused. I was ashamed in some sense. Like there were there were just people like throwing out the words, Oh, you're so gay, you are a sissy, you know. Mm. And you would have this negative connotations. And also because you've always been, oh, it's you shouldn't be a girl, you know, like you should be a good Christian boy, you know, a man up kind of thing. Yeah. And having someone tell you, Oh, you are a sissy little girl. I mean, that is, like, in conflict with who you are supposed to be, you know. And, yeah, so it, in that sense, there was that embarrassment, that fear. So it it builds even more of those defences to be, oh, I must be a guy, I must try. Mm. Yeah, um, there wasn't much internet then as well. All the way till, I didn't even have a phone through JC. Do you mind <laughs> ask how old are you? Oh my goodness. You shouldn't ask a girl. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll ask you no, se- later. Yes, no, you can, just, you can just, ask me later. No, I just want to yeah. get it for like the, uh-huh. um, what do you call that? Um, for for like my own, you know, <laughs> the era kind of thing. Okay, let me let me just mute us for a while. <laughs> then I just... Okay, so I got it. I just wanted that <laughs> context of our our era because yeah. like, it feels like we are in the mm, yes, very yes, similar we're era. The same era. Yeah, we're in the same. Yeah. Once you talk so about like Yahoo mm-hmm. and all, you know, yes. it's it's the kind of 
M M I R C I C Q. I I had a phone. Yes. When I was in sec three. Oh, you were the lucky ones. When I was in sec three. I remember, you know, um, I was so like having a phone was just my Nokia three three one oh. It was a. No, it was eight two five zero. Eight two five. Oh, okay. That small yes. tone, you know, that dual tone kind of thing. Uh, I remember like browsing through the Straits Times, you know, just looking at the phones, wow. the okay. edge, you know. Like, I just wanted a phone. You went to JC. Yes, I went to JC. He got a phone. And I didn't get a phone in JC. Oh, only after I JC. I got a phone in Army. Yes. Okay, but you went to JC, mm-hmm. and it was the first time you had like female classmates. Yes, I always hung out with the female classmates. Somehow, I just wanted to be part of that group. Like, I I don't know. I don't know why. It wasn't so much a sexual attraction kind of thing, but it was really a frequency. Uh, yes, you like just, you just click oh my goodness, yeah. like sisters, I just want to be there. Yeah, kind of thing. And I I was in a band all my life, so I spent eight years, like um, eight years, no, six years. So secondary school and JC in the band, and I guess in some sense because like you would be surrounded like the two years in JC really surrounded with like girls and everything, and it was just it was the most enjoyable time of schooling <laughs> just being in the band yeah and I guess we really just built that um that whole like how do you put it. It's just just that family la that you somehow grow up, mm. yeah, grow up with. So yeah, what was the army experience like? Your army experience? Wow, my army experience. Um, it was an over huge overcompensation. Yeah, mm-hmm. just really trying hard. So um, at that time, I started realizing that fitness was important, and to be a guy, you need to be fit. You need to look fit. There's a certain aesthetic that, you know, a guy should look like. All these are attempts by you, right? Yes. To yeah, okay. so um, I got quite successful in some sense while, like, through BMT and everything. <coughs> so my 2.4 was a 936 kind of thing. <gasps> yes. <Okay. laughs> back then, uh, back then. So you're like a combatant kind of... Yes, okay. I was past B, um, thrown straight into like one of the craziest companies in BMT. Ninja. And no, not Ninja. No, but I was from Ninja. Oh, mm. that's crazier. Oh, that's crazy. I was still the commando, commando uh, yeah. guy. Yeah, it was oh my commando goodness. Guy. Wow, yeah. Mm. So my mine was, okay, I was in Cougar. Yeah, uh, so Cougar back then, my batch. School one, school one. Yes. Yeah. It, was, it was just as crazy. Mm. And I was the same batch as... <laughs> As who? <laughs> Lee Hao Yi. <laughs> who is Lee Hao Yi? Lee Sien Long's son. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, Lee Hao so okay. The guy that, in Gov Tech now. Yeah, yeah, that batch, my goodness, the people around him mm. were... Um, they they had to present like, oh, they were still strict. But if you compare their Ooh, company to... Lee Hao Yi. Yes. Lee Sien Long's son. Yes. Eh? Lee Hao Yi is which son? Huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. I can't remember. <laughs> is he the one who came out? I don't know. No, okay. okay. Oh, remember. no, he's not, he's not, he's not. That one is he's Lee the Sen. one who plays Yo-Yo. Okay, sorry, that's yeah. Lee Sen Young's son. Ah, okay. Okay, that's Lee Sen Okay, sorry, you were talking about mm. BMT. Yeah, so um, huge overcompensation. Mm. Yeah, and I enjoyed my time there because mm-hmm. um, I would say Ami really taught me a lot of how a guy thinks. I, yeah. mean, I mean, you're in an environment where you're just immersed in, yes, in boys' school. Yeah, goodness. in boys' school, everyone is still like sort of childish, kiddish and childish. Yes, and very yeah. young. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but in the army, yeah, it taught me like, oh, so these these are guys. Okay, so I have to, you know, find a commonality and be one of them. Do you have a yeah. chance to, because I would imagine, because I was from... Uh, a boys' school mm-hmm. as well, um, Catholic a uh, Catholic boys' school. Mm. Okay, I'm from Catholic high lah. People know so. Okay. Uh, a lot of these boys, we in Catholic high. A lot of us come from okay background. Mm-hmm. You know, family okay background. But we went in army, right? Other than it's a boys' environment, 
you meet people from different segment of life. Yes. Like yeah. really from different, you know. Um, so you had a chance to interact with people that you never had a chance to. So I've I've already I already got to do that. Yeah, because I was from a neighborhood boys school, mm-hmm. and in in secondary school I auditioned for Singapore Youth Orchestra. So I was in the SYO. Uh, back then, and the people in the SYO, they are actually quite well off, well to do. Mm. Yeah, and so I've experienced the poorest. I'd say I was middle income and the upper, like echelons of society. Yeah, the the privileged yeah. kids. Mm. Mm. Okay, and in army, yes, because um, after. After getting our BMT, yes, because my BMT batch was the leadership batch. Almost everyone went to command school, mm. and everyone was like very highly educated. Yeah, in like the top JCs. Yeah, so after I came, I actually went to the SAF bands. Yeah. Oh, you went to join so, the band, okay? Mm-hmm. Because of and that was an oh, even more overcompensation because there were gays in the band. Okay. And they knew. They knew I was different, mm. but and that's where the defense got built even thicker. Yeah, cause like, um, they are, you know, attracted to me, and they're trying to push me, push at my buttons, finding like poking the wall, you know, to try to find a weakness in it. So, um, I don't want to do this. You know, I'm supposed to be a Christian boy. You know, who is against homosexuality. Yeah, so. It was a very very difficult time there, cause there were some people where I was because like of the temptations. In some sense, yes, because okay. there were some of them who were like, "Wow, I can actually click with you, and mm. you are someone who." And they sort of mm. knew how to tackle you, right? In some sense. In some yes. sense, yeah. Yeah, but they were nice. They weren't like pushy pushy. They were like poking, and they knew they were like, "And this one not out yet." <laughs> yeah, they kind okay. of. Mm. When was your first sort of um, relationship with? Uh, do you have ever had a relationship a with guy, yes. a guy? Okay. Yeah. So that was and a with uni. a girl as well. Girls, yeah, many girls. Okay. Um, one guy, yeah. So that was in uni. So I dated this guy. Um, unfortunately, it was just sex. A lot of sex. There wasn't much of an emotional connection in there. Yeah. So. Um, so he's gay. I, yes, he's gay. Okay. I identify as bisexual. I still do. Like more, more pansexual. But it's easier to just tell someone, "Oh, I'm bi." Mm. Yeah. So, um, yes, the many girlfriends to try to hide everything as well. Yeah, Your first girlfriend was in. My first girlfriend was in army. Oh, okay, in army. Yeah. Okay. So. From the clubs. Uh no. Okay. Yeah, she was a musician. Ah okay. Yeah so. That one was like, oh, you know, you play this instrument, I play this instrument too. And mm. like, we would talk about it, we would practice together. And she was also Christian. So, yeah, so it was like easy to find commonalities there. How do you feel like dating a girl? Oh, it's okay. Mm. Yeah, like, it felt, I don't know, it felt like an insider where, oh, I could get to know more about, you know, <laughs> femininity. Mm. And At a very like intimate kind of yeah. connection level. Coming out right in 2019, mm. you t- you spoke about you know thinking about it in 2019. Then of course we all know that the end of 2019, COVID came along, uh, and in March of in April of 2020, uh, yes, we had uh, a lockdown. We had a, we had a lockdown. Mm-hmm. Did COVID uh, change any of the way that you thought, or did COVID actually accelerated or or, or shape the events that happened in the last two years? COVID actually helped. Mm. My coming out, my transition, because um, you you would wear a mask, and everyone was supposed to be isolated. You know, like we had our circuit breaker and everything. No one was supposed to go to work. Everything was on Zoom and stuff like that. Yeah, so even meetings, um, when when you talk to people, you'd be on Zoom, and all I needed to do was. Just dress how I wanted to dress at home. Oh, meeting. Okay, put on my work shirt. Mm. Sit in front of the camera. Yeah, and if I went out, I would dress feminine. Yeah, because you know, you could still go out for like 
your basic necessities to get food and whatever, yeah, but yeah, you had to yeah. go straight home. Mm. Yeah, so you had to tapao home, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, so I would go out. I would literally go to Orchard just to tapao something, sit outside and eat. Mm. And just, because no one was there. Mm. And I could like be myself. Yeah, and so uh, I would only need to put on like eye makeup. Yeah, yeah. and that was, yeah. that was amazing. So, but you dress as yourself. Yeah. Mm. So I dress as a girl. And there was one day where I I think this was this was after Circuit Breaker. I can't remember when it was. But I know I remember the place. Orchard Central, Guzman y Gomez. Mm-hmm. I was in queue, I was on my phone. And the counter staff went, uh, miss your order. And I, I, I at that time it hadn't registered, you know. Mm. Yeah, because you're still in the okay. I'm so used to Mister, 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 and then and then that person I can't remember who who that person was lah. But yeah, I just uh, miss your next. And I looked up. Oh, it's me! Mm. And I was like, oh, the, yes! <laughs> oh my goodness! And and at that time, my hair was still like okay. short. Yeah. Was, yeah, and it was an um, it was just. Mm. It felt so validating. So it was yeah. like COVID gave you because also there were a lot lesser people on the street. Mm-hmm. It gave you, did it give you some confidence and courage yes, to do did. like a sh- little social exper- experiment as well to go out. Yes, yeah. Um, I got stares like in the trains in on public transport. Um, at that time it was still very scary because mm. um, you don't know why they're staring at you. Either they're clocking you or just because you're really tall. And then your mind just goes to that negative place that, oh no, they know. Oh no. You know? Yeah, so um, I still don't know up to today whether it was because they clocked me or just tall. I hope it was just tall. Mm. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. All these stares that you get, right? Inevitably. Mm-hmm. Whether it's two years ago or whether it's even today. Um, how does it affect you? How do you think it has, has that been um, what do you call it, uh, evolution of your of your attitude towards it? Okay. Hmm. My attitude towards it. In in the start it will be very negative. Yeah, because this is like the first time I am, you know, taking that brave step out. And I don't know what's gonna happen. So uh, when you get those stares, and it's like people don't just glance at you and look away, people glance at you and stare, like and scan you from yeah, like head to you toe. are like, mm. what is this? You know, they kind of. So there's that very oh no, why are you staring at me? Yeah, and I said like your your brain just goes to that negative part of mm. everything, and it's like oh no, yeah, but I guess as you get more validation and more people taking care of you and saying like, hey, we support you. And your mind just goes to like, oh, okay, whatever. Stay lah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been confronted in public? In public? Uh, I still do. Okay. I, okay, not not confronted like head on, but okay. like it will be a side passing comment kind of thing. The other day I was at Tampanese in the change. It was late. I can't remember. Was it a... It was a weekend. Yeah, and someone just had this passing comment. Uh, two guys. You they mean were, when they were when they walk past you? Yeah, when I walk past them. Okay. Yeah, they were staring at me. I could tell. Okay. Like, cause I mean, it's the it's the. You know they can't stare, and they tried whispering. One of the guys tried whispering, but it's I I don't know. People think they're whispering, but they're not. Mm. <laughs> so he was like, "I'm guilty of that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, this one real girl or not? So mm. in 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 Hokkien la, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, it was a very, uh, like, after trying so hard, mm. like, I still get that. Mm. Don't know this one real girl or not. So, yeah, those, I, in in the, I do have to acknowledge that very often I get the cis passing privilege. So, um, in the trans community, like, the, I don't know if I can say that it's a toxic goal. Because we all want to be accepted, we all want to be, um, you know, integrated into society. We don't want to be called out. Yeah, we just don't want to stick out, you know. And so, our defense mechanism is to pass. 
Yeah, so what passing means is that, you know, you just want to blend in and look like you were born female. And you try all the ways to... Yes, you try you everything, try everything you okay. can do it. Okay. And um, it couples with dysphoria as well, where when you look at yourself, your outward appearance doesn't you know, coincide with who you see yourself as in your mm. mind. So there's... Uh, what do you call that? Uh, cognitive, cognitive kind of like dissonance. Yeah, cognitive, like, uh, dissonance. Okay, cognitive yeah, dissonance. Yeah, kind dissonance. of. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So you feel aligned with how you look like. And that's uh, and that's euphoria. And people's yeah. perception of you. Yes. And so if someone like outrightly says and questions it, you'll mm. be like, oh shit, I'm not actually looking the way I perceive myself. Mm. Yeah, so, and then the dysphoria sometimes hits. But um, I am thankful that, you know, I experience much less dysphoria nowadays. I feel it's the medication. Yeah, so, in the, the if you want, like, deeper detail, um, it's, um, it's contentious. Yeah, it's controversial as well. The what's that, levels what's that? of... The levels of hormones okay. that I'm receiving, okay. it's a very very high level. It's one of the it's one of the higher than the female average level, but that really helps my brain. So um, it just suppresses. So what happens? Uh, this doctor theorizes that because your brain needs estrogen, mm. every time testosterone kicks into your brain, it causes you to have dysphoria. Yeah, so because your brain needs estrogen, um, if you don't give it enough estrogen, yeah, the dysphoria happens. So if you have a higher than normal amount, it you know, it makes sure it makes yeah, it makes it very certain that, you know, dysphoria will be very you will not get dysphoria just randomly. Because mm. there are some times where your brain just thinks thinks and then like, oh shit, you know, I just suddenly feel dysphoria. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, but mostly I, I I suspect it's from external kind of factors, yes. right? Mm. So now, whenever I feel dysphoria, it's because one or two moments mm. where someone says something, or the other day it just happened where I thought, okay, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna wear business formal today. Yeah, because it was a it was a quarterly review meeting. Mm. Yeah, so I wanted to try something, and I already bought it from mm. the US. So like really just pantsuit and everything. And I stared at self I stared at myself in the mirror and I was like, oh no. Yeah, I cannot. And and the dysphoria just hit lah. Yeah. So it's uh it's more of an external kind of thing. So there's no more internal like, oh, I feel like a guy today, you know. Yeah, no more of that. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Mm. Do you ever do you think that you were uh be more at peace as your journey progress? Journey? As in, as because in, you are now uh-huh. still taking, going through the transition, I would suspect that, you know, um, even like uh, down the road, right, mm-hmm. there, might, there, were, there, were, there were still possibly people who might question you, that think that Definitely. you are. Definitely. So, yeah. how, how do you intend to deal with it? Because from what I hear, I, I feel so tired and I feel so <laughs> sick. I, uh, yeah, I know I've, because when you go out, right, mm. and, and inevitably people are going to look at it and there these two guys who made that passing comment are not going to be the first, neither are they going to be the last. Yeah, definitely. And if you if you get that sense of like de- depression and dysphoria, like you mentioned, it's going to be so hard on you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have learned then, you know, going back to this cis-passing privilege, mm-hmm. that sometimes it's a very toxic thing to have. Yeah. While we would like to integrate into society. Yeah. I think society should move and, you know, be a little more mature now to know that there are people who are the outliers and we should embrace people like these. Because there are a lot of trans people who have contributed to society. Yeah. And they had to hide in plain sight. It is only recently where we are finding a voice to come out. We've always been here. It's not a, oh, suddenly there are so many people who are becoming trans. No. It's a, suddenly we are finding the courage to step out. 
That means people, do, those who have took it to their graves, essentially. Yes, there are people okay. who have done that. And there are actresses. There's an actress who finally came out after, I think, 20 or something mm. years mm. of yep. hiding. Yep. Yeah. And so, that with that, I think going forward, I, I mean, I've, I've come out, I've been so public about everything I'm doing. Like on Instagram, it's, uh, yeah, this is me. I'm trans, proudly trans. This is my life. This is the true me. Yeah, so I guess in some sense, educational for the rest of the public. And I'm striving to be someone who will be more visible. Yeah, so I now take pride on being trans. I mean, to come to a point where if someone says like, Ah yeah, you can't be trans. You're actually you stop lying. You're a girl. Mm. Yeah, to come to that day, I might actually be quite sad, because like, um, that part of me mm. is as much as I would want it now to be seen like a normal girl, but to lose the identity that I am trans. Mm. Yeah, that. That is something I think I would be very sad. Does that stem yeah. from a place of um, championing for a cause? I guess so, yes. The activism. Mm, the activism. So my dream is mm. to be super like um, super successful in all the businesses that I'm doing. Okay. And to eventually one day be able to get like a house. Um, I mean, I already have a house, but as in to have a... A, uh, a shop house. Okay. Where I'm, I would like to extend from the tea project. So if people don't know what the tea project is doing, they are actually housing other underprivileged trans people, and um, they give them a place to stay, and um, they can go and find work and get out of that shelter and be independent. So I would like to be an extension of that. So I think it would be easier if there was a shop house where people would be living upstairs and coming down for work and running a cafe downstairs and things like that. So that's yeah. the aspiration. That's the that's the end goal. The end goal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Talking about society mm. and um, going back to your little um, help SOS help that you had from Thailand. Mm-hmm. That one and a half weeks in Thailand. Mm-hmm. Two weeks in Thailand? One and a half weeks. One and a half weeks in yeah. Thailand. Uh, what's the experience like? The, as in society now. Uh, okay, maybe we talk about, you know, so you call your friends, <coughs> you say, I need help, I want to try mm. this, and you went over, and of course, um, we all know that the Thai society is a lot more um, open mm-hmm. and accepting, and mm-hmm. to them, it's just a part of their society. Yeah. You know? It's a very integral part. Especially if you even go to the universities, you know, and all. It's so common. Yes. How do you feel like, you know, being in an environment like that the first time, being able to be yourself? It was actually very daunting at at the start. Mm. Because you're still worried about, like, you know, you are not local, but you don't look very female. Mm. Yeah, and you're like in the middle of that weird looking kind of um, still a guy, but you know, cross dressing kind of thing. Yeah, so it's so you're still very worried, but then when people are actually when, when people don't really care, uh, this I'll come okay, I'll talk about my US experience in a bit. Yeah, so when when people don't actually care, as in they don't, like, don't care, that means they don't stare at you. Yeah, they don't stare at you. You're just like, oh, a- you're just, just, just another, another one. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, the kind of a, uh, oh, yeah, that kind of look. So that's uh, that's uh, that was, in in some sense, I felt safer, and with the friends around me, yeah, it kind of helped. Mm. How did your parents react when you came out? First came out. <laughs> my dad threw me out of the house. Mm. Yeah. So uh, my mum was very shocked, but then not really shocked. Yeah, and she she was the only one who really accepted me. Mm. I don't think she accepts um, like the whole transition fully, 
But she, she loves me. Unconditionally, I really love. feel mm. that love. Yeah, and it's usually harder on mothers. Why do you say yeah. so? Because like the like your mother is the person who has seen you grow up, and is the person who gave birth to you, mm. and in that sense, she would take everything on herself, and say that, oh, there's something wrong with me. I gave birth to this person. Mm. Something is wrong with me, and I, I, I don't know if this is what happens. Like, yeah, to a lot of other people who are very resistant to it. Yeah, but um, there are there are the extremes, lah. Yeah, where the mum really loves the kid, and there are those who really just cannot accept it. What about your yeah. brother? Initially, my brother was like, "Oh, you'll always be my sibling." But mm. then after that, yeah, <laughs> we haven't talked for a whole year. Okay. Mm, so. So you don't think he accepts you, lah? No. Yeah. Okay. And you have not spoken to your dad for the last. I century. tried because I used to stay with my dad before, like he threw me out. Yeah, and I, he was the first one I prepped. You know, because I you knew opened up a conversation. Yeah, I knew because he was the one who was so adamant that oh, you're a boy. You know, yeah, this should not be happening in my house. You must, yeah, God wants you to live a certain way and everything. Yeah, so that was that was him, and like I knew I had to prep him. Mm. So like the conversation started in 2019. You give it to him in yeah. like hints and. Exactly. How, how do you do it? I just just open up the conversation about like people being trans, people being intersex, and things like that. And the I mean a joke, you know that because he's he's always wanted a daughter. Mm. Yeah. So my mom, unfortunately, okay, between my brother and our, I, uh, we were supposed to have a sister in the middle. My mom fell down in the shower. Okay. Yeah. So that was really sad. He was devastated. Then they had me, and I guess in that sense, um, he got over it, and like when my brother had like my niece, mm. my goodness, he really just showered her with love, mm. and I had ex- I was <laughs> okay. hoping for the Can same, imagine. you know, okay. that kind of thing. But uh. yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that case, and yeah, so I kind of prepped him, like you know. What happens if you know I just show up one day? Hi, I'm now your daughter. I mm. think I was like, no, don't talk to me about that. Mm. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. So, um, slowly along the way, I started dressing a bit more differently at home. Yep. Like my, I would be in pajamas in nineties and stuff, cause like you know COVID. And then, whatever I don't have a meeting today. I'm just going to like stay in my pajamas the mm. whole day. Mm. Yeah, and then he kind of caught on to it. Mm. He's like, "Why are you dressing like that? You know, yeah, this is wrong. Stop doing it. You know." But like, I'm an adult. Yeah. You know, yeah. So like, he can't really like say like, you know, take this off, go and change, and yeah. So. In that sense, I thought that he would kind of get used to it. But he never, he never did lah. So you were yeah. like trying to condition him lah. Some sense, yes. Okay. <laughs> what happened yeah. the day he threw you out? Wow. Um. Cause I had gotten my place, I was okay. ready to get out. Cause, um, the months, weeks leading up to it had been, um. It would be cold war. Then conflict, then cold war, then conflict. There was never a good day or a good experience. After. After mid twenty twenty one, yeah. Mm. So, um, I got a place, and I was like, okay. Um, so I just went to his room and said, like, hi, I am moving out. Uh, I'm moving out soon. Yeah, I got a place. And he was like, "When are you leaving?" Mm-hmm. So I gave him that date. I said, "No, 
you get out in you get out by this Friday. Mm. Yeah, so I had like in some sense he didn't really throw me out, throw me out immediately, but he was like, get out of my house. Mm. Yeah, you have till this date. Um but what came after that was the throwing me out where I was like uh because he he then said that um you return your keys and everything. I'm like, oh, uh, so does this mean that I won't get to come back? And he said, "Yeah, with you looking like that, yeah, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to see you." Yeah, and so it's like that. Oh, so you you never like you don't want to see me again, lah. Yeah, because this is who I am. You cannot accept it. And it was a uh, like until you wake up, hmm. you know, I don't want to see you. Yeah, so he actually said that. In your mind, do you think yeah. that? Is this owning you? I don't know. Yeah, I guess. I guess. But you didn't think about it. It was more of a, um, like whatever he said, felt like he wants disowning me la, In that sense, like, yeah, cause it was a, I don't want to see you. Mm. Yeah. Did your mom try to play a mediator role in, in this? My mom has been trying, mm-hmm. but I guess when you get to that age where your mind is really just set i mean why the why the older generation is the easiest for all this like um what's it called um co- controversial what's it um conspiracy theories mm, like conspiracy. they buy in okay. yeah it's because they are in some sense their mind is just set set yeah and like they don't. They don't see sex charity as having a spectrum, lah. They don't. They don't. And it's also that generation. Yeah. And yep. the Christian kind of like, they're only doctrine two. and that yeah. kind of okay. Do they know about your work in the US? They don't. Until today, they don't. Yeah, no. Okay. I never told them. But your family, your, your other friends would know, right? I've told. Yeah, I've told some friends. Because you are you are quite open and about it. You're yes. on Twitter and all. Mm-hmm. What happens if he finds out? If my parents find yeah. out? Wow. I think my mom kind of knows. Okay. Yeah. Um, my dad, I'm not so sure. Mm. Because my mom has seen... She has seen me on Twitter. Okay. Yeah, so like looking over my shoulder, she was like, what's this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's like, oh, um, it's, it's just social media. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at your Twitter, uh-huh. so uh, sort of like in preparation for you know today's <laughs> podcast. And your girlfriend was okay with. Yeah, 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 yeah. okay, <laughs> cool. So it's work. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I so you have like you have been very active on Twitter, oh. and you have maybe about a one point six, one point seven, about a thousand six hundred posts. Oh, I do. I went wow. through. I went through all of them. Oh, I went through all of them. And wow! <laughs> and I, I know that you started your Twitter in maybe about uh, June, July last year. I actually deleted a lot of posts before okay. that. Yeah, okay. so the yeah presenting the me to the world. Yes, June, July. Okay. Mm. What was the motivation behind it? Like just now, you mentioned about attention. You mentioned about, but actually having you know going into Twitter and posting, um, even posting your stuff, posting uh, a full face. Yeah. Yes, coming out very yeah. publicly on a platform like Twitter. What made you do it last year? What made me do it last year? Yeah, like like, like what what happened? Do I don't you, know. I think you, I you think decided. Just things built up to it. Where you finally like, oh, you start an OnlyFans and you're like, okay, the way to get more subscribers is to, you know, just marketing. And you start OnlyFans, what's the motivation behind? Is it the money motivation or is it? was both, um, I was already very comfortable in my job. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about diversifying income and whatever, any extra sources and streams, why not? So you are and not facing like financial difficulties, no, I'm right? Not. You're not, yeah. right? Never never had you had no. financial difficulties, right? I want to be like, yes, this is on camera. Yeah. This is fully me. Okay. I want to be someone in porn in the in the adult industry. Okay. Yeah. So why, why, why? Why the motivation? Why? Maybe